All right. Um, what, what we're trying to accomplish is basically identifying when something is out of whack within the, within the body. And how we define normal really can depend up to a, depending on who, who, who you're talking to, can mean something different. Um, when we're looking at anatomy and, phys and physiology, it's basically looking at function and structure being appropriate so that we have this internal milieu, this internal function um, at an optimal uh, level. And normal should mean good health and, and, and no disease. However, there is some, um, some other ways that we can look at that. Uh, normal blood gas values, none of that should look like it's foreign to you. Okay? I would feel very comfortable giving you a blood gas and having you classify it for me. I know you're all excited about that one. We know about the respiratory and non-respiratory or, or metabolic uh, disturbances that can be present. And of course, that degree of compensation is always the one that makes it more challenging for folks being able to identify when it's a partially compensated uh, situation. PFTs we know are related to um, age, gender, and height with eth ethnicity having a, a, a role also. Um, weight, although we don't, it's not used in the predictive equations, does have an, have an impact obviously on their um, normal values. <clears throat> and if you're really geeky, you can go into Egan and take a look at the, re at the regression e equations that are there to be able to determine for any value what the predicted value should, should end up being. On the adult side, uh, Morris, Crapo, and Knudsen are the three primary ones we end up using. Not that you need to know that, but Crapo is the one that has to do with the uh, Mormon population in Utah uh, as far as the predictives. And Sue and Polk are, are pediatric reference values. Uh, we're going to go with that 80 to 120 percent is considered normal with the exception of being the FEV1, FEC of greater than 70 percent. Um, again, if you look at Egan, they use something else called LLN, lower limits of normal, as opposed to using that 80 to 120 percent. Um, probably a little more accurate uh, but for our, for our purposes, we'll just stick with that 80 to 120 just to make life easy. Um, and with the lower limits of normal, it's basically talking about is a 95% confidence interval. And not knowing what the hell that means is beyond me. But they're saying we'll allow no, someone who does not have a disease, we'll allow 5% of those people to be classified as having a disease rather than going the other route in someone having a disease but not being classified as such. So it's, it's kind of erring on the side of uh, not missing people in, uh, in the process. Rick's lung box. Yeah. <laughs> Comes back to haunt you. We talked previously about how we get these measurements, that the three values that cannot be measured with simple spirometry, residual volume, total lung capacity, and functional residual capacity, you need to look at some other mechanism to do it. The three primary ways are uh, the closed circuit helium dilution, the open circuit nitrogen washout, and then the body box. With the body box, you're not really measuring functional residual capacity. You're measuring something called thoracic gas volume. It's a little bit different. Um, in theory, the, with uh, the presence of airway obstruction, the first two can underestimate that value. It's always correct when you're using a body box. And a key point is that they're basically all started at the end of a normal exhalation, so we're wanting to de de derive that FRC in the process. And they're highly reproducible. Helium uh, dilution, again, is the key one is the uh, thing that I want you to remember about is that it's a closed circuit. Because it's a closed circuit, there's rebreathing going on. You have to have something to scrub out the CO2 as well as to <laughs> replenish oxygen. Otherwise, you're going to have your patient passing out on you, which is never fun. And that's kind of what it looks like. Just re keep having this rebreathing until an equilibration exists between the quantity of helium that is inside the patient and the quantity of helium that is inside the spermometer. Nitrogen washout requires that a patient breathe 100% oxygen until all the nitrogen has been washed out. Um, usually, it takes 
six, seven minutes, and we just collect the volume that is that is present, and we can from that derive what the um, FRC is. And then the last one, the, based upon Boyle's law, is the body box. Um, you know, if we know a series of pressures inside the box and inside at the patient's airway, and we know the volume of the box, we can tell what the volume that the patient started with. Besides the lung volume measurements, we also met. We also measure the uh, flow rates that a patient can attain. Usually, we're doing this to be able to evaluate the severity of any airway impairment that you end up having. Um, and we, this is what the tracing would look like. Tell you what the force vital capacity is. And again, just like last year, I, I, I assume if I give you a tracing, you're going to be able to derive that value, along with the FEV1. Um, as far as what those two values are. 2575 are middle to small size airways. FEF 200, 1200 is large. And the peak flow is what we use. We usually use to determine uh, if there's an airway, any, any airway improvement. Um, although the FEV1 is probably a better index because the peak flow is very effort dependent. And that's how you could tell a peak flow, expiratory and inspiratory. Well, it's well known you Oh, and you should know how to calculate between liters per second and liters per minute. Just multiply by 60. MVV, we didn't talk a whole lot about, but it's basically a test that we do for 12 to 15 seconds, having somebody breathe as fast and as deep as they can. Faster, faster, deeper, deeper. <laughs> and from that, we extrapolate out what it would be in a minute's period of time. Flow volume loops, this is what a normal one would look like. You can see with restrictive, you have normal looking flow rates. The slope of this line is pretty much the same, but you would just basically have a little reduction in lung volumes. With an obstructed airway disease, you end up having that scooping out pattern. So those middle to small sized airways are the ones where the flow limitations occur. And we know that that occurs secondary to uh, that dynamic compression that you end up having with a forced exhalation. Um, obstructive diseases are airway related. Restrictive diseases are either lung parenchyma or chest wall related. There's an inability to get the air in with a restrictive, inability to get the air out with an obstructive. Air is my wonderful thing out of Egan. Um, I think my two-step process was a, was a little bit easier. So, it's there if you, if you ever need it. You can actually get, get 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 down to specific disease states when you're when you're looking at a light like that. Uh, obstructive diseases typically have that airflow limit lim limitation. That's the important component of it. Uh, airway resistance would be increased. Um, and we can do it by looking at the FEV1 and the FEC. Multiple reasons, and one of the things we'll do as we go through the course is what differentiates differentiates emphysema from chronic bronchitis, from cystic fibrosis, from asthma. They're all obstructive diseases. How do I know which, which, which one is the causative mechanism? And through all the things we're going to talk about, we can end up doing that. And that just talks about why those small to medium-sized airways are scooped out. Those are the airways that are non-carbilaginous. If the pressure outside the airway is greater than the pressure inside, you're going to have an airway collapse. And that's basically what that is talking about, that equal pressure thing, where the pressure outside is greater than the pressure inside and collapses it downward. Oh, I don't worry about that one. Pousset's law talking about flow rates. We know the radius is the most important component. Um, so anything in the denominator, as that goes smaller, the pressure required to ventilate goes up. Same is true with things in the numerator. If you want a faster flow, you've got to generate a higher pressure to, to get there. And we've seen this one before. And radius of the tube being the most important one. <clears throat> one of the things where, when we get to COPD, we'll, we'll find out, both COPD and asthma, we're going to look at the pulmonary function data to tell us how severe this disease state is. So as we go through time, when a patient has COPD and comes into a physician's office, ideally they're looking at their P 
PFT readings to see how their disease is progression, progressing. Um, so they may initially be at the moderate stage, but as time goes on, they become more severe in the process. And what ends up happening, as we'll see, is that stage one, there's a certain group of things we would do. Stage two, we would add some additional therapy to it. Stage three, add some more, et cetera, et cetera. So to know how to properly treat, you have to know how severe it is. Okay. Restrictive diseases um, are basically a reduction in total lung capacity. Um, really, all lung volumes are, are, are reduced in the process. And this is where, again, we would look at, rather than the flow rates, because the flow rates are within normal limits, it's just that they can't get the air, air in to get it back out again. Measurement of compliance, we know, is the change in volume over change in pressure. When you have a reduction in compliance, it becomes much harder to move the same quantity of air as you had previously. And that's kind of what ends up happening as compliance falls. That's when pulmonary fibrosis, ARDS, pneumonia, pneumothorax, the pressure required to get any amount of volume in goes up. And just for completeness purposes, emphysema, if you measure their compliance, is a very high compliance. It's not that it's a good thing, though, because it just, when you have a high compliance, you also have a low elastance. And that, that's the essence of what emphysema is. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, Laplace's La La law, just talking about surface tension and why as an al alveolus becomes smaller, the surface tension is greater, molecules want to bind together, surfactant acts as the agent to counteract that and not allow the two of them to collapse down. And so kind of looking at the obstructive versus the restrictive as compared to normal. Pre and post bronchodilator therapy. Um, we're gonna go with the 12, what the American Thoracic Society says, 12% 12, 12 improvement and 200 milliliters in either the FEV1 or the FEC. And again, that's the, the no cause new minus old divided by old to get there. Diffusing capacity, normal is 25, uh, but there are actually predicted values that you can get based upon age, height, and gender. Um, and as diffusing capacity becomes more impaired, uh, more mortality in increases, so bad thing. Um, how it's done, uh, we're not gonna really get ourselves too wound, wound up with for now. It's basically we have a small amount of carbon monoxide that we breathe in, have the patient have to take a breath hold. Carbon monoxide is very diffusible across the alveolar capillary membrane under normal conditions. Patients with, the, with diffusion impairment obviously would not have that amount diffusing across. And there's multiple reasons, but remember Fick's Law talked, or uh, Fick, yeah, Fick, Fick's Law talked about um, distance as, as, the, as the alveolar capillary membrane thickens diffusion falls, um, and the other one is just lung volume itself. As I have a reduction in lung volume, I have less diffusing capacity. I think we talked about bronchial pro provocation, didn't we? A little bit? No? It's a nasty test. It's one where we, where we purposely induce bronchospasm in the patient who has hyperactive airways. That's mean. But... It's one way to diagnose. Patients who have symptoms of asthma but have a normal PFT, does he have asthma? Does he have reactive airways? How do we know for sure? Well, we give them an agent like methacholine, which is a um, cholinergic agent, and what ends up happening is it stimulates bronchospasm. And we can, using a specific um, dose, we can identify at what point we trip them over into, into bronchospasm. And... Um, then, of course, we're nice and we give them some bronchodilator after so that they're healthy when they, when they leave the pulmonary function lab. We'll find out more about that one. And there's also some exercise testing that we can do to evaluate severity of, of, of disease um, where we're going to monitor not only their minute ventilation and their tidal volume and their respiratory rate and all that stuff, we're also going to measure their oxygen consumption and their CO2 production. So while they're on an exercise bike or on a treadmill or on a, uh, for somebody who perhaps doesn't have, doesn't have legs or um, has a poor functioning legs, you can even use an arm ergometer 
to generate an increase in workload and measure then how the body res re responds for it. Okay, good? Review? All right. Did you ever, did you ever hear of these things? That sounds like, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds, sounds like a Mary uh, thing. Yeah. Um, anatomy, again, deals with structure. Physiology deals with processes and functions. Um, and we're going to deal with both of them. Pathology is basically the study of, of the nature and causes of disease. So how that structure changes leads to functional changes, leads to impairment of the cardiopulmonary system. The pathophysiology is basically um, how these processes are, are manifested um, through signs and symptoms that we end up being able to, to assess. Okay. So in the case of a pneumothorax or congestive heart failure, both will lead to a difficulty in breathing. The reasons why are obviously different in the process. Those clinical manifestations are we want to look at not only the signs and symptoms that you guys are all really good taking pulses and respiratory rates and listening for, for breath sounds, but also looking at laboratory data, chest x-rays, CAT scans, whatever else may be needed to be able to, uh, to get it. And for every disease, there's an etiology, which is basically the cause, okay? Um, the presence of cancer can, part of the etiological origin of that is cigarette smoking. Um, so it's basically what, what's, what's the trigger that, that's causing this pathological change. And management, we want to get into management as far as how we're going to treat it. Are we going to, um, are we going to give a bronchodilator? Are we going to put a chest tube in? What's the solution to how to fix it? Um, how many people have ever heard of DRGs? Is that a relative term? Yeah, okay. It stands for Diagnosis Related Group. And every, dis every disorder or disease, I, sh I should say, um, has a DRG assigned to it. And it's based on the discharge diagnosis, but the problem is we're doing this concurrently when the patient's in the hospital. This is how hospitals get paid, okay? When, um, and I'll just take a easy example here. Stacy comes in, she has appendicitis, she has an appendectomy done. The hospital is paid a flat fee for that service being, being provided. If she can get through the hospital stay, and let's say it's $1,500 is, is what the hospital gets paid, and the hospital can provide that care to her for $1,200, they make a $300 profit. If they get paid $1,500, but it costs the hospital $1,800, the hospital loses $300. Since most insurance, most patients in a hospital are, um, covered under Medicare, they being one of the largest payors involved, Medicare uses this DRG system. Well, the other private insurers have kind of figured out, you know, it's probably a good way to end up paying people rather than paying on a fee-for-service basis. This started out in about the mid-80s, so I, part of my career, we actually were working under a fee-for-service basis where the more you did, the more you made. And respiratory care departments were wonderful places to generate revenue because you just do more treatments. Hire more staff, do more treatments. You got a toenail that's infected, you need a breathing treatment. Come on over. Um, now it's exactly the opposite. Now we're a cost center. The less we do, the better for the hospital. But you need to do enough to treat the disease. So it's that fine balance that you end up having to strike between doing just enough to get the job done, get the patient discharged, and not having overall, overall cost. There's a new twist to this that they just started up, um, I, I believe it's in two, two, 2013, but um, if a patient is discharged and readmitted within 30 days, you don't get paid for that second admission. Oops. So all of a sudden, the management of patients with asthma or management of patients with emphysema and COPD, uh, we're kind of important. Because <laughs> if we're seeing that patient coming back again, 
we know that that's going to be a loss for the for the hospital in the process. So. I believe it's I I believe I believe it's all of them. Yeah, if you just look at the at the payer, and that's right right now just uh, Medicare, but believe me that'll that'll the blues will pick that up also at some point along the way. And what about this kind of they try to change the diagnosis and make it like a silly thing to do? Well, it's it's re, re, remember too, it's not the physician who necessarily gives the final diagnosis. That's that's done by the health information folks. So, um, go ahead. I was going to say, one of the, the uh, patient follow-ups that they do, and maybe you alluded to the follow-up and the treatment correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. Part of it all, part of it is also, if, and hopefully when you get to that point in time, you sit down and you talk to patients, it's very interesting how little they know about their disease state. Gee, what, who could probably, oh, wait a minute, that could be part of, part of our job, is edu educating the patients on, on what goes on. You guys all know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, right? Medicare is over the age of six, 65. Um, Medicaid is what is for anyone who is under 65 who meets certain income cri 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 criteria to pay for health care. Okay, enough of that nonsense. And here are some examples of some of some of our DR DRGs. Not that we really care, but there, there you go. There's 400 and some different ones that are there. So this assessment process, um, and there are places that have respiratory consult services. So when the, when the physician writes an order for a patient, he says, uh, consult for respiratory therapy. And the respiratory therapist goes up and does an assessment of the patient, looks at the chart, looks at their H&P, looks at any diagnostic tests that might be there, does some patient interviewing, patient assessment, Asking them, uh, you know, what, what their primary complaint is, chief complaint, and then developing a protocol or developing through the use of protocols a treatment plan for that for that patient. A lot of physicians don't utilize that, which is unfortunate, because there are more than t more times than I can tell you that something is ordered and it's the inappropriate thing to do. There could be better ways of doing the same exact ultimate goal. Um, but through the process, then you use that. Uh, uh, you develop a plan, you implement it, you evaluate it, you, you re and you revise that in the process. And I think did Mary go through the SOAP process? When we do our case studies, that's how we're how we're going to approach them is putting that into practice. That's subjective data. The objective data. And you see the subjective are things that are patient feelings. Objective data are things that we actually measure. It's one of the things that just drives me crazy is when they talk about pain being the fifth vital sign. I, mean, I hate to tell you guys this, but it's not a sign, it's a symptom. So pulse oximetry would be the fifth vital sign. We all go there. Um, doing our physical examination, you know all about the inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And inspection can be anything that we observe related to the patient and things that would include data that's derived from, from an interview as our vital signs. Um, a lot of things we can end up looking at as far as um, use of accessory muscles, purse lip breathing, all signs and that there is uh, some, all manifestations that there is something going wrong on the pa part, of the, part of the patient's breathing. Yeah. Love that one, eh? Yeah. You can see some peripheral clubbing there and uh, when you get when you get to your pediatric rota rot rotation hopefully you'll be able to see some folks that have some of this pronounced clubbing pedal edema swelling of the pardon me mm -hmm. cystics yeah. Uh, yeah nasty uh, palpation then is Basically, anything that you do that you assess when you touch the patient in some fashion, um, including things like looking for the position of the trachea, uh, the use of muscle uh, movement, um, tactile and vocal fremitus, and looking for symmetry of, of, of ventilation there. And whether or not there's a reduction in the chest expansion or 
whether it's uni, uni, unilateral in nature. Tracheal shift evaluated at the uh, top of the sternum. Um, you'll act, if, if you ask a lot of people, they'll tell you, look for tracheal shift and they'll, you know, they'll holding the larynx. It's like, no, 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 it's got to be lower down than that. <laughs> so really the best place to look is right at the operculum, which is the opening into the thoracic cavity. Can, there's some disease states where the trachea will shift away from the affected side, somewhere it'll shift towards, and I think Mary probably talked a little bit about that when she talked about trachea shift. Bremidus is basically feeling the chest for, vib for vibrations and the fact that um, in the presence of some uh, air, uh, areas that are consolidated, that the sound transmission will not happen. Um, can also have uh, Vocal uh, fremitus, where you have the patient say 99, and you can feel the tell patient there. There's an example of it. Again, using the sides of your fingers as opposed to the tops, you're much more sensitive. And doing a structured pattern evaluator. Percussion is that tapping mechanism. A normal sound would be a resonant sound for the lungs. Abnormal would be um, either a dull or a hyper resonant would end up having. Um, one, of the, one of our medical directors, um, and they were nice enough to, and they still are nice enough, to have the students spend a day in their office because it's not often that a respiratory therapist see healthy people. <laughs> we, we, we see them when they're sick, not when they're coming in for a well, well, a well visit checkup. Um, but he, he, was a, he was an ex exquisite diagnostician in um, He's one of the few, few people that I know that routinely did something like percussion to evaluate the position of the, of, the, of the diaphragm and picked up on patients that had a diaphragmatic paralysis on a, one, of the, one of the hemi diaphragms. So you guys know how to end up doing per percussion, right? Normal would be that resonant sound, dull with consolidation, and um, <coughs> hyper-resonant when there's trapped gas. And then auscultations, again, uh, we know the different types of breath sounds depending upon the location. A bronchial breath sound would be appropriate over the main stem bronchi, but would be totally in inappropriate over the peripheral lung fields. And there's all kind of adventitious breath sounds that maybe we'll bring in some audio tapes and you can, you know, okay, that'd be awful, painful. But same idea as far as assessment. And, per, and relating that to the different lung segments that are involved. So I can determine if I'm hearing crackles over a particular location, what lung segment would, would, would that be associated with. Um, normal sounds are vesicular, bronchial when you have a collapse around that tube. So I'm hearing a bronchial breath sounds, that means there's some consolidation in that area. Diminishes what you would end up having when you have a lot of air trapping. We know about wheezing <coughs> through a small area. And one of my favorites, whispering pectoral key, where the patient whispers and you hear, if you hear it very clear, that means there's a sound of uh, uh, area of consolidation over that area. So depending upon the disease state, using those things to be able to pinpoint what, is it a pneumonia, is it a pneumothorax? You know, breath sounds, percussion, auscultation, inspection, all gonna be different in the process. Okay, I think this is where we stop. <laughs>